Okay, it's 12.30, so uh, we'll get started. Welcome everybody to First Friday with Ali Green. My name is Amy Lovett. I am the Professional Development Officer at Writing New South Wales. And before we commence, I'd like to go over some technical aspects of today's chat. So you'll be muted for the whole event to ensure the best sound quality. Let us know also in the chat if you're having any trouble hearing our speakers or having any technical issues and we'll do our best to help. We have a couple of staff members on the ground in the background. When in doubt, the best possible solution is to exit the Zoom meeting and then try to rejoin from the link in the email. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, we invite you to do so in the chat box as well. We'll take as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A at the end of the event but please feel welcome to chat to your fellow attendees throughout as well. To see our speakers, toggle your screen to speaker view, which is in the top right hand corner of the Zoom window. To see all the other attendees, you can toggle your view to gallery view, but we recommend you stay on speaker view for the entirety of the event. We're recording this event. So if you drop out or you have to leave early, you can always watch it on our website later. I'd like to commence now with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation from whose lands Riding New South Wales is on and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands where you are joining us from today. I'm personally zooming in from a Wabakul and Waramai country today in Newcastle. And feel free to make your own acknowledgement of country in the chat box if you would like to do that now as well. I now, now welcome Ali Green from Pantera Press. So Ali Green is the CEO and co-founder of Pantera Press. She was named one of Australia's 100 most influential women by the Australian Financial Review. Ali is the 2020 Sydney Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Arts and Culture and has been twice selected as one of Australia's top 20 young leaders in philanthropy. Ali is a Harvard Business School alumna and sits on a number of industry committees and boards, including our very own Riding New South Wales. Thank you so much, Ali, for being here today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for joining. I'm really excited for this session today. Okay, so to get started, as co-founder of a publishing company, I'm assuming you have a deep love of books. So could you start by telling us your first memory of reading books and stories and what they mean to you? It's such a good question. Um, and there are so many books that I've loved and so many cherished memories I have reading with family members when I was little. But I think actually the best story that I have that describes my addiction to reading and when I really you know, realised that this was something more than just a love, but something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life uh, was when I was 19 and had uh, just finished university and had decided to go backpacking around Spain. Uh, and so I was with a few friends for four months uh, and had to pack everything that I wanted to take in my backpack to carry it around the whole time. And my backpack consisted of two outfit changes and 22 books. Because this was before iPads, it was before ebooks, um, and we were backpacking, backpacking around Spain where we knew that, you know, I didn't speak Spanish or I didn't speak Spanish beyond being able to order food. And so I knew that I wouldn't have access to many English language books when I was there. And everyone laughed at me and thought that, you know, this was kind of an insane way to travel. But let me tell you that I read all of those books long before the end of the trip and then had to make trades with other backpackers along the way for more books. And that was, um, you know, a time in my life where I really realised um, just how much reading, storytelling, escaping with books really meant to me. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. Quick sub question. Are you the kind of person who would have left books in, you know, backpacker hostels or did you have to take them all home with you? No, so I did leave them where I went. Um, I think in my early days, I would have been the kind of person that would try to hold on to every single book I've ever loved. Um, but 
it's very easy to run out of space, especially. (laughs) So now the books that I keep, uh, the books that I have signed um, or those books that have very significant special memories for me. Otherwise, I just try to pass them on because I think that, you know, particularly working with, with so many authors, I know that one of the best things that we can do is if we find an author or a story that we love is to share it with other people and recommend it. So I think passing on of books is a really wonderful thing to do. Absolutely. So you started Pantera Press in 2008. Um, What was your background before publishing and how did that kind of all come about? Good question. So my background was not in book publishing at all. uh, And that's, I think, uh, quite a unique journey into the publishing industry. Uh, So for me, my background was business strategy. And I really came at to came at Pantera Press, uh, I guess, from uh, a sort of a left of field position, which was that at the time I just finished uh, my master's in business strategy. I was working in the literacy space with consulting firms uh, and really knew that I had this love for books, had a passion for sort of helping to close the literacy gap and hadn't really been able to put it all together. Um, At that time, my dad, who was a um, banker by background, had been writing a novel for many, many years. And it was around that time that he was signed by an international agent in the US and that he started sharing his experiences of that with me. And it became really clear to me, um, not so much from his experience, but from the experiences of of the other Australian authors he soon became connected with, that in Australia at that point in time, it was virtually impossible to be discovered if you were an unknown Australian writer, particularly writing fiction. And that was for a raft of reasons, um, some of which were that it was a global recession. It was the global financial crisis. Uh, Publishers in Australia were trying to focus on their shore bets. So they were uh, encouraging their best-selling or well-selling authors to write more books rather than signing on unknown risky entities. And they were also buying international licensing rights of international best-selling authors and publishing them here in Australia. And then on top of that, um, they were only accepting submissions via agents. And that was obviously a filtering process that they needed. Um, But what we were seeing in Australia was that a lot of the literary agents were no longer taking on new clients. They too were pushing their existing authors to publish more books. And so it was kind of this weird landscape where there was so much writing potential, but it was virtually impossible for someone to see your manuscript, let alone for you to get published. And so I guess that was a a light bulb moment for me, which really brought my background uh, together with my love for books, that there was this void in publishing and why wasn't anyone doing anything about it? Uh, And I spent almost two years, excuse me, almost two years sort of researching the industry, talking to everyone we could get our hands on, festival directors, um, bookstores, other publishers, designers, printers, agents, you name it. And what it came down to was that, you know, traditional publishing had a lot of traditional infrastructure, which made it very hard for those big businesses to take a risk on an unknown author. Uh, And so that was when we stepped in uh, with this idea for wanting to do this and really wanting to contribute to writing culture, but needing to find a different business model that would allow us to do that. Well, in that sense, it's it's not the worst thing that a, a banker and a business strategist came into publishing in that way, although untraditional, especially at a time in 2008, as you said, it was a pretty shaky industry Mm. Um, and most industry, industries were shaky at that time during the, the global financial crisis. So at the time, did anybody ask you what the heck you were doing? And, and if they did, what did you say to them? Like what made you really decide to give it a go? So literally every single person we spoke to <laughs> said, what a beautiful idea, but what are you doing? This is crazy. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, I mentioned sort of this innovative business model. And part of that was that from day one, we have been a purpose-led company. Um, We were a social purpose business. And really what that means 
is that our purpose, so for us, that is all about having a meaningful impact on writing culture, investing in that next generation of writers and readers, that that was embedded in every single element of our business model. Um, so for us, that's, you know, nurturing new voices. It's also publishing books that matter. So books that can spark uh, you know, conversation, books that can spark change, books that can spark imagination. And then also um, having those be a commercial success enough to allow us to use that money to fund not-for-profit that are also working um, on that, you know, to nurture that next generation of readers and writers, particularly in under-resourced communities and minority um, and disadvantaged areas. So we always kind of had this philosophy underpinning our business from day one. And this was quite confusing. Um, these are sort of buzzwords now, but back then, 14, 14 years ago, um, you know, this idea of a social purpose business was quite unheard of, particularly in publishing and particularly in Australia. And so most people, when we spoke to them about the business, couldn't quite wrap their heads around it and sort of said, oh, you know, love that you're really wanting to nurture new voices, think you're crazy. Have you thought about, you know, working for a charity or starting a charity or funding a charity rather than, you know, trying to have this whole publishing business that would fund that broader change that you want to see in society? Um, and, you know, that came from everywhere. But I, I think that sometimes when you have an idea that you really think has legs and could make that change that you want to see, you just need to back yourself. And for us, we knew we could do that uh, in a quiet way. In fact, the name Pantera Press um, comes from the word panther and panther, uh, Pantera is panther in a number of different languages. And we came to that name because we really felt that as a business in our early days, we would be like a panther. So we would kind of like slink around in the reeds and see what was going on. And then we would either make a big splash and jump out on our prey, or we would slink away and no one would know that we were there. Um, so we, you know, right from day one, we had these big ambitions, but we knew um, that it might not go anywhere, that, but that we really needed to give it a chance and we thought we could do this in a different way and that we could do it in a low cost way you know we for the first few years we worked from my parents kitchen it was just a few of us we had very low fixed costs we worked with lots of talented industry freelancers uh, and we took it from there. Mm. So the philanthropic philosophy at Pantera is all about good books doing good things which I love so why do you see philanthropy philanthropy as such an integral part of your your business and your life and is this something that's always been with you from the early days of business strategy yeah it's such a good question I think um, I mean more broadly it's uh, come through my family so my dad's parents um, fled war in Poland uh, and immigrated to Australia and so they came to Australia with no English language skills at all and so it has kind of been ingrained in my dad, in his sibling and, you know, down into uh, me and my brother, um, that education is kind of the key, um, access to education is the key to opportunity and success. And so that has been a driving force just within our family in terms of, uh, you know, how we think about things, the, you know, where we spend our attention um, and our areas of kind of passion and interest. Uh, so that's sort of been a very, yes, key part of just my upbringing long before sort of thinking about book publishing. Uh, but when it came to book publishing, I think, you know, when we started to talk about this idea, we were very focused on how we could bring all of our families sort of passions and areas together, which was certainly business, the arts and philanthropy. But I guess further to that was that I'd been invited to this uh, trip in Arakoon, which is a, a Aboriginal community in far north Queensland, a, maybe a year or two before. Um, and it was a wonderful trip. And, you know, being able to spend time with the kids in that community was absolutely amazing. But it really highlighted to me how big our issues with literacy are in Australia. And so coming back to Sydney, uh, 
and sort of digging deeper, I was shocked to find that these aren't just big issues that we have in rural communities, but in regional communities and in metropolitan communities. And, you know, I think as someone growing up in Sydney, I spent so much of my childhood thinking, oh, you know, we're doing a fundraiser at school because we're raising money for kids in other countries. And at no point does anyone ever highlight we have real problems in our own backyard and our literacy rates are far from what they should be in Australia. And so one of the things that we really wanted to see change here um, was this investment in the next generation of people. Um, and obviously, you know, for us, that has come about in terms of readers and writers in particular. But we knew that there was a really big role to play in levelling the playing field. There were lots of charitable organisations in particular uh, doing a lot of reactive work, uh, but it's very hard to do proactive work to level that playing field right from day one. And so part of the reasons that we thought about this social purpose business model was because we realised we had a better chance of having that impact by running a commercial business and then using those funds to fund that change rather than trying to kind of set something else up in that space that would have all the red tape of a charity and so on. Mm. It seems like the the arts and the business side and then the education philanthropy is a perfect triad for what you've done with Pantera Press. Yeah. Um, so you've almost been going for 15 years now, other than the fact that you started out on the kitchen table and I assume that you are no longer doing that, <laughs> although COVID, yeah. Um, <laughs> how have you seen the business change and evolve over that almost 15 years? It has been uh, just a 180 transformation, really. So, you know, back at home at the moment, welcome to my uh, welcome to my study at my house. <laughs> but we we did move away officially from the kitchen table. So we um, we first moved to a very small office in Neutral Bay. Um, we've always been based on sort of the northern beaches, north side of Sydney. Uh, and then after a few years, our team grew. And so we moved to a larger office space in St. Leonard's. And then at the beginning of last year, uh, when things looked to be opening up, we moved our office again to a new space in North Sydney because our team had grown again. So we're now a team, we went from a team really of two of us full-time and two uh, part-time um, to now a team of, I think there's 18 of us. Um, so we're a much, much bigger team. Um, you know, I guess one of the big changes for me is that when you start a new business, you are a jack of all trades, you know, you really are doing everything. And now we have wonderful specialists in each area of our business with that expertise. And one of the really nice things uh, about our team is that, you know, the majority of people in our team do have publishing experience from large multinational publishers. And we've been able to poach them and bring them across because, they've been really excited about our growth strategy and really excited about the social purpose piece of our business. And, you know, I, I think what we're seeing more broadly in the entrepreneurial community, not just within book publishing, particularly coming out of the pandemic, is that people have really changed their priorities on how they want to spend their time, what's important to them, um, and feeling like what you're doing is contributing to a bigger purpose is certainly one of those driving factors. Mm. That leads beautifully into my next question, actually. So as a, as a millennial myself, I've often witnessed younger people feeling quite disheartened about traditional publishing and wondering whether their ideas or their work will be taken seriously or if there's just sort of any hope, especially considering what you were saying earlier about um, a lot of publishers and agents would just sort of stick with what they had. Mm. Um, and I know that at the 2018 Global Summit of Women, you presented on why millennials are critical to 21st century economics. So could you share a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so there's so many, I think, points to unpack that you've mentioned. Uh, one is that millennials operate very differently and um, I will caveat this by also saying the next generations also operate very differently because I think that people often still use millennial as kind of a generic term for young people, whereas millennials are now sort of, you know, in their 30s and They're 40s. old. We're old, <laughs> exactly. But I do think that what we saw in the millennial space 
was this desire for purpose. And so we were seeing a lot of social enterprise companies cropping up, which were companies where, you know, if you could buy a pair of shoes, would you buy those shoes from the sustainable organization that was contributing to social good? Or would you buy them from the other company if the prices were moderately comparable and the offering was comparable? Um, and obviously, it, it, you know, it's a bit of a no brainer that if you've got those choices, you'd be going with the ethically sourced or sustainable organization. And so we saw this huge influx in demand and, and then, of course, supply in these kinds of spaces. And I think that that has dramatically changed the landscape um, across all types of business and consumer behavior, um, not just publishing. Uh, in the publishing space specifically, I think that the young adult readership plays such a critical role in kind of shaping books. In many ways, they're well ahead of the curve because uh, the young adult readership, while it often contains people from 14 to 95, um, the core kind of group within the YA readership uh, tend to only be in that readership for a couple of years before they've, you know, before that they've moved from middle grade into YA and then they move on to adult. And so this is kind of a readership that continues ticking over. And because of that, the trends are so much more apparent. And even just, you know, in the last few years, I think that demand for diverse voices, representation of all kinds of people and backgrounds and themes in books are so important so that you can see your reflect yourself reflected in what you're reading. Um, and so that the topics that you're reading relate to you and your life, you know, that demand has just increased exponentially, which is wonderful to hear and see. Um, but I think the impact of that more broadly is this understanding that, you know, publishing, um, whether it's, you know, in the award space, um, as in book awards, whether it's, you know, the editors that are coming through, um, you know, whether it's the kinds of books that have been publishing, there has been a very traditional kind of white bias around all of this. And it's really important that we, as a next step, are changing who our gatekeepers are, um, are really mentoring and finding ways to bring people from all different kinds of backgrounds into publishing, and that we're focused on representing a diversity of themes, topics, starting important conversations, being part of important conversations. And that's kind of a change that I think everyone in publishing can contribute to. Absolutely. And it's definitely been at the forefront of our minds more than ever in the last couple of years, which is mm. great. Um, a question that's also in the minds of so many of us in the last couple of years is how has COVID affected the publishing industry? Could you share a little bit from the perspective of an Australian publisher and particularly how it relates to, do you think it's easier or tougher now for debut authors to be published? Both. So I will yeah. say on the debut author thing first before we get to COVID, um, I am pleased to report that in the 14 years since we started, the attitude towards debut authors has certainly changed. Uh, so, you know, publishers who were once completely inaccessible now have reopened programs that might not be that they're actively seeking unknown authors, but they certainly have avenues where you can apply to them, which might be a pitch session that they run or, you know, a, you know, fortnightly or monthly submit your first chapter kind of story. Mm -hmm. um, so publishers have become much more accessible and the desire to find the next big debut author has also been on the forefront of publishers' minds in recent years. And that's, of course, because Australia has seen some massive breakthrough debut authors like Jane Harper, um, Trent Dalton. You know, there's a raft of really big Australian debut authors that have come through. And this has changed the attitudes of publishing houses. So I think that that is a wonderful thing that has happened over time, but then also quite dramatically in the last few years. And so I certainly think that there are more opportunities now for debut authors than ever before. We also have much more technology, um, you know, to allow for this kind of access. So no longer is, um, you know, self-publishing a taboo thing. There are certain genres and certain books that will always work much better um, in sort of self-publishing online channels than they ever will through traditional retail channels. Um, and so I think that that, that understanding 
um, has really opened up so many more doors for debut authors as well. So there's a lot there. Um, in terms of COVID, um, COVID has been, uh, you know, it's had some real positives and some real negatives for the publishing industry. So overall, you know, publishers, um, overall the market saw growth last year, which is, you know, fantastic, particularly considering that non-essential retail was closed for a big part of it. Um, that said, you know, the books that have been doing really well were uh, sort of more commercial titles that were sitting in your discount department stores. So your Big W, your Kmart, your Target. And that makes sense because people are doing their essential shopping and those books are right there on their doorstep. So we've seen a big influx in kids' books and we've seen a big influx in sort of those more commercial branded authors that naturally sit in those channels. Um, and that, you know, I think that makes perfect sense, but it has been a much more challenging time to launch the brands of new unknown authors because, and, and that's a big focus point for us, 45% of our authors that we published last year were debut unknown authors. And, you know, to this day, obviously, that continues to be a really critical part of our business. Um, but to bring those authors to market, we are heavily reliant on word of mouth. So we're very reliant on festivals, we're reliant on events, we're reliant on PR coverage. And while we have a wonderful head of publicity who has an outstanding reputation for getting PR coverage for these unknown authors, there needs to be space in the news for this to be reported on. And when you've got so many global emergencies um, that are just on those new feeds every day, it's very hard to kind of get that messaging out. And I think the other thing that's worth noting is kind of the mental capacity of all of us, um, you know, right now, whereas, you know, in 2020, we saw lots of consumers and lots of people in book publishing saying, you know, I just need to escape with a good book. I'm buying lots of books. We're in lockdown. This is scary. You know, I need books. 2021 um, was a different story. Everyone was sick of fear and lockdowns and sort of wanted to re-emerge into the world. So when Victoria and then New South Wales were thrown back into lockdowns, that mental capacity changed. And, you know, and I think an example of this is, you know, within, within my own publishing house at the start of every single one of our team meetings each week, we start off with a section that's, you know, what have you read and loved this week? And it's just a really lovely way, knowing that all of us love reading, um, a really lovely way to recommend books to each other. And, you know, and, and you know, obviously not Pantera Press books. These are just books widely published by anyone and everyone. And really, I would say for the last six months, no one has had that many book recommendations because that mental capacity to kind of sit and read has just been much harder. And so there've been podcast recommendations, TV show recommendations, but that mental capacity for Australians has certainly shifted in the last little while around books. And I have no doubt that we'll head back into that place. But I also think that you know, in the coming years, we might see some different trends in book publishing that we might see a demand for more joyous books, for lighter books, um, for exciting books in that space, rather than the darker, grittier, um, you know, books that kind of require you, particularly books that require you to kind of reflect on lockdowns or fear or pandemics and think that that's kind of a, that'll be a no-go area is my guess mm. for, for a little while anyway. Very interesting. I think that you're what you're describing is like a collective exhaustion and definitely my reading life in the last couple of years, but it hasn't stopped me buying books. So hopefully that's <laughs> the case for so many people as well. Um, you mentioned self-publishing before, which I know is a, a really interesting topic for a lot of people. There's some conflicting advice out there about the merits of self-publishing. So in your view, you've mentioned that it's changed over the years, but do you think that it's still something that is frowned upon by publishers or do you think that that is really opening up? I don't think it's something that should be frowned upon by anyone. I feel like historically authors felt like being published by a publisher added a certain level of credibility. Um, and yes, in all honesty, there are things that publishers can offer um, that make that experience really beneficial there's a lot of value we can add but that value is for the right kinds of books so you know for the right kind of book that would work very well in a traditional retail channel 
we can offer editorial curation, um, you know, we can make sure that there is a strong cover that speaks to that specific sales channel <clears throat> as well as the specific reader. We can make sure that we have a PR and marketing team and machine ready to speak to the audience of <laughs> that book. However, if it's a book that is not going to appeal to a reader that goes into Big W, or that goes into Dimmix, or that, you know, um, to a lesser extent goes into an independent bookstore, there's only so much value we can actually add. And I think it's in those scenarios where it's worth thinking about who is my audience, where do they buy their books, and how do I best connect with them? Because when you're signing on with a publisher, ultimately, you were giving up a percentage of your earnings because you are paying someone, um, you know, and their team to add value um, to your book and its journey. So one example is the entrepreneurial space. You know, there are a few books in that space that do sit well in traditional channels. Normally, those are the books that are written by entrepreneurs with really big platforms, existing <laughs> platforms to begin with. But there is a huge entrepreneurial reading community and most of those books would not work well in traditional retail channels. The consumers that go into those channels are not buying those books, but those readers are voracious readers, voracious readers. And so, you know, for most books in that space, I would suggest that self-publishing can be a great alternative because you are not giving away a percentage of your income. There are platforms that are set up to easily make your book accessible in print, in ebook and there's organizations you can work with for the audiobook as well um, and all of those readers sit online and purchase their books on Amazon or listen to their podcasts through Spotify um, so I guess it's situations like that there is a there is a real value add that publishers bring but mm -hmm. it so much comes down to what are you writing who are you writing for where are they purchasing their books and, and what is the strategy to get that book out or that content out to the broadest possible audience? Um, and yeah, it might be that a publisher in traditional channels is absolutely the best way to do it, but it is certainly not the only way to do it. And there's lots of different options out there. Um, I guess the only other thing I would add to that question is that accessibility makes accessibility harder. And by that, I mean, um, you know, when self-publishing on ebooks became accessible to the general public, so many people instantly thought, well, you know, I'm going to, great, you know, I can bypass any gatekeepers and I can, make, I can instantly upload my book and it's available for sale elsewhere. And that is true. So now your work is very accessible, but there are so many works that are accessible. How do people find you? Um, and so, you know, that discovery piece is really important. That curatorial piece is really important. Um, you know, there's certainly things we do as a publisher to ensure that people are finding our books. But similarly, you know, those general principles apply where you need to find the trusted sources. Um, you know, historically that has been uh, independent bookstore owners or people who work at independent bookstores. It has been... Um, you know, newspaper reviewers. And then in more recent times, it's also become, you know, uh, book, bookstagrammers. So um, influencers on Instagram, book talkers, influencers on TikTok, um, book, booktubers, influencers <laughs> on YouTube. And so, you know, it's not that um, these are new principles, it's just that they're manifesting in different and new channels, but that mm. same concept of connecting with the trusted sources and having them, you know, recommend and refer the book is still that key piece that drives discovery. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, in the, the coming years, we might see some more light kind of stuff mm -hmm. that doesn't make us, you know, freak out too much about the state of the world. So is that what you are looking for at the moment? I know Pantera is open for certain commissions. So what is it that you, you're looking for and what are the, the hot genres right now? Yeah, look, we're, um, we are looking for lots of different things and I guess um, informed by how our business came about, we have always said to ourselves that we don't want to pigeonhole, pigeonhole ourselves into a specific area, um, that, you know, we are just looking for those books that, 
matter, those books that can start conversations, those books that are well written and that we just can't put down. Um, you know, we're looking for those books with that X factor. So um, we are looking very broadly. That said, you know, the areas that we're focused on for fiction would certainly be uh, commercial women's fiction. So I think that speaks very much to um, these books that can cover serious issues, but also joy um, and optimism and hope. Uh, we're looking for literary crossover books, so not sort of high-end literary, but those really well-written books, but that could speak to a broader audience. Um, we have had lots of success publishing YA authors historically, and uh, we've also had a lot of success publishing crime authors historically. And so I think those, you know, continue to be areas of focus for us. In terms of nonfiction, our remit is very much, um, you know, books that spark conversations and change. So we are actively searching for books written by, um, you know, written on all sorts of different topics um, by all sorts of different people. Um, and it's really important to us that we are building a very diverse list, a diverse publishing list um, and books that they themselves can really make a difference. So I know that's quite vague in many respects, but it was, you know, it, it, you know, it's also quite specific. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, could you share a bit about the commissioning process at um, Pantera? So when a manuscript lands on your desk, what happens then? Yeah, great question. So um, I guess there's two ways that commissioning happens. One is the direct manuscripts, that, or three ways. One is the direct manuscripts that come to us via our direct submissions portal. So when people submit to us directly online. The other is when agents send us submissions. So we do accept submissions from agents as well. It's just that we prioritise books based on what we're looking for rather than um, who the gatekeeper is. Uh, and then uh, there's also the books that we actively go out and sort of tap someone on the shoulder about and say, have you thought about writing this book? So in terms of the norm, which is, you know, publishers being submitted directly to us once, uh, sorry, authors submitting directly to us, once a manuscript lands in our inbox, uh, our editorial team uh, sort of divide and conquer. So they split up all of the manuscripts that have come in based on their areas of expertise and they will read all the accompanying information. So they'll read, you know, a synopsis, um, they'll read information about the author, and then they will read a big percentage of the manuscript, um, not always chronologically. So you always start with the beginning because that gives you a real sense of the writing style. Um, mm -hmm. But then, and you've already got the synopsis, so you know the key points of where the story is going. And so really you're, for fiction, you're looking for, you know, how does that pace continue? How is this story actually executed? How does the writing style and voice and tone lend itself to that? Um, so it's usually very clear early on if a book is not for us. And so, you know, we always make a point to respond to all of the authors that submit to us um, because we don't think it's right to leave people hanging. Um, there are lots of reasons that a book might not be right for us, which I should mention. Uh, it, and, and often, you know, people, whenever you speak to an author, they say, oh, I was rejected by blah, 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 which means that my story is not good. And often that's far from the case because so often the reasons that a manuscript might not be for us actually have nothing to do with the writing style of the book. And we make sure in those cases that we say to the author, you know, we encourage you to keep writing or to submit future books to us or to apply elsewhere. Um, so some of the reasons might be that we already have a book on our list that is that speaks to a similar audience or a similar theme. And because we have, um, I guess I should have mentioned our approach at Pantera Press is a little bit different to other publishers. Other publishers have diversified portfolios of authors. So they have a huge um, number of authors on their list. They publish many, 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 many books a month. Um, and for us, we publish sort of up to three books a month. And we have done that intentionally so that we can make sure that each book we publish within that month is not competing with each other for promotional opportunities, for sales opportunities, that they're getting the full attention of our entire team and that we can then offer sort of that long tail bespoke continued attention that other publishers with bigger lists might struggle to do um, because, you know, there's so many books on your list and so for us that is one of the main reasons that a manuscript might not be right for us that it directly competes with one of our existing authors and while it might be fantastic um, we're not in the business of cannibalizing 
authors within our own stable. Um, another reason might be that we don't have, we don't feel like we've got the right expertise for that specific book. Um, so there are obviously lots of areas that we do have expertise in, but if it's out of our area of expertise, it, it would, the book would do much better if it was in the hands of a different publisher with a different vision for it. Um, another reason might be that uh, we just don't think we can sell it in the way it needs to be sold to make it commercially viable. So it might be that it's a beautiful story, but that its audience is very small. And so, you know, we wouldn't be able to get it out in the sales numbers we need to make the book commercially viable. So there's, I guess, a myriad of reasons about why a book might not be right for a publisher. But going back to your question about what our process is, so a manuscript will come in, our editorial team, uh, we've got quite a large editorial team for the size of Pantera Press. Uh, we've got uh, how many people? One, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, people in our editorial team. Uh, so all of them will read all of the submissions that are incoming. Anything that they think really spoke to them, fits our remit, um, that they just loved or that they see real potential for will then go to one of our publishers who will read it. Um, assuming the publisher loves it, they will either go back to the author with some feedback and do some back and forth before it's taken to our team or it will go straight to an acquisitions meeting with our team. And an acquisitions meeting is basically where the editorial team are saying, we found this incredible book, we love it, you know, this is why this author is a perfect fit for Pantera Press. This is why we could add so much value to them. Um, what do you think? And so that's then the time for our PR marketing and sales people to say, this is what we could do. This is how we would make sure that we could get as many copies out as possible so that it reaches the broadest audience. And this is sort of what budget we would need to do this kind of marketing and publicity, et cetera. Um, so oftentimes that meeting will then come down to, we've got this great book are we the right publisher to make it work? And if so, then we would make an offer to the author and the entire process would start from editing to cover design to sales strategies and so on. And normally that process from signing to publication is kind of a minimum of a year. Okay. So um, I'm an author, for example, and I've just received an email from you saying, hey, we would like to publish a book. What happens then for, from the author's perspective? So from the author's perspective, well, normally we would say we're really keen. Um, can we meet? Uh, okay. you know, our business is very much about relationships and you know, building long-term relationships. So making sure that actually we would work together well and we're on the same page is really important. So we would either organize to do a Zoom meeting um, to introduce you to your whole team, um, or we'd bring you to the office depending on logistics and COVID and everything else. Um, once we've met and we've agreed that yes, you know, we would all love to work together. This feels like a really good partnership. We would give you a contract, which you would sign. Um, at Pantera Press, we have two different financial models. So in publishing, most publishing houses uh, have a traditional financial model, which is where they offer an advance and a royalty. And that royalty is normally 10% of the recommended retail price, less GST for print book sales. Um, and we do offer that financial model, but the model that we started with um, and the only model that we had for our first eight years was a profit share model. Uh, and so that was not that authors contributed any money themselves. It was simply that we were lowering our risks taking on new authors um, because we weren't paying huge advances up front. And more importantly, we weren't paying royalties out while a book was losing money. Instead, the moment the book broke even, we would split everything coming in for that book 50-50. Um, and so the idea being that you get a much greater percentage of the upside and we are protecting our downside, you know, at that riskier end. Uh, so we still have that financial model. We find that um, it is very attractive to uh, new authors who really want a career in writing and want to back themselves. And it's also very attractive to the opposite end of the scale. So um, sort of nonfiction e experts who have a really big platform and know that their audience is already engaged and that they'll sell a certain amount of copies. So really for them, there's no risk. It's just the extra reward. Um, so we offer that. And then we also offer our 10% um, royalty traditional financial model. Uh, and for books where it works, we will just offer both and kind of go through the finances we think 
as I said, relationships are really important. So for us, that transparency piece is key. Um, so in those cases, we would go through both models and kind of say, this is what either would look like for you. We would then sign the author. Um, if they have an agent, obviously we've done those discussions through the agent, but it's still very important for us to meet our authors and for them to meet the faces in the team who will be working mm. with them and representing them um, and that they have a rapport with their editor because, you know, and that editorial experience and that development is something really critical that we can add um, as value in that publishing process, but you need to feel um, a trust with your editor and an understanding and that, you know, um, sometimes it's just not there and then, you know, you need to find an alternative solution or it's just not going to work. So mm. there's a lot of that relationship piece. There's the contractual piece. And then once an author is signed, uh, they would be very working very closely with their publisher and their editor on the big kind of structural developmental aspects of the book. Um, so plot, character development, all of that kind of stuff. Once it's moved on, once that stage is finished, it then goes through copy editing, which is sort of the more specific line by line edits. Um, and then once that stage is finished, it then goes to typesetting. So laid out so that it looks like an actual book and then proofreading after that, which is when we're really looking for formatting issues, any final errors, grammatical issues, typos, etc. And during that um, long process time we've also done the cover design and so you know we will always talk to authors about how they've pictured the cover we will then also put down all of our thoughts about who the cover needs to speak to and what sales channels it's sitting in um, because I think one of the um, shouldn't be a surprise but one of the things that was a struggle when we first started was making sure that we were focused on the difference between a cover that we thought was beautiful versus a cover that we thought mm -hmm. would tell the reader of that book exactly what they needed to know about it to make sure that they would pick it up from wherever they were purchasing books. And there mm -hmm. is a kind of a big distinction in that space. And ideally what you want to end up with is a book that everyone loves the look of and that speaks to the sales channel and consumer. And so that can take a little bit of time to get there, but we're very collaborative with that process as well. Um, and then PR and marketing strategies and plans are going on at the back end at that same time. Um, you know, we do a lot of pre-release work, particularly for unknown authors. So we do a big seeding campaign with retailers to make sure that they've read the book ideally and loved it um, and maybe even met the author before our sales force comes in and actually sells the book to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a lot of work to create industry buzz before the book comes out. And then we do a lot of work to create consumer buzz on the day of release and after the book comes out. Mm. So that's kind of probably the start to finish. <laughs> yeah, it's such a process, isn't it? And mm. did you mention before that that's like a, a 12 month process usually from the acquisition to this, the publishing of the book, the sale? Yeah, so yeah. it's about 12 months. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of that is that, you know, the books have to be in the warehouse a couple of months before release. The sales force has to have sold the book in, you know, maybe four or five months before release so that you've printed enough copies for that initial first print run. Um, yeah. But the biggest piece is that editorial component because developmental, depending what shape the book is in, um, that process can take, you know, how long is a piece of string, I guess. Yeah. But every single book goes through an editing process. So even a book that is highly polished um, and feels very finished will still go through an intensive editorial process um, process it's mm. just that sometimes that developmental piece at the beginning um, might be lighter but other than that sort of all books do end up going through that same process and and mm -hmm. that that's what we need to allow time for because we would much rather hold a book off to another year or a later year again after that rather than bringing out a book that is good but not the greatest that it could possibly be yeah Perfect. Thank you for being so detailed about the process. I know it's a huge question in the minds of so many people. Mm. And speaking of questions, I'm going to throw to the audience now because there are some really great questions coming through from the almost 100 people here with us today. The first one is a great one. So Kate has asked, do you think people wrote more books during lockdown? I think people finished writing more books in lockdown. I don't know if more people started it as a, as, as you know, um, a passion 
or a side project, but certainly a lot of the submissions we're receiving are from people who said, you know, I've been writing this book for years and lockdown was the opportunity for me to really focus on it and finish it. Yeah. Um, Kay has asked, when you're looking for new voices, does the age of the author influence your decision? How old is too old to have a new voice? No. Um, it, well, the only scenario I can think of where it might influence it is if we were publishing, a, if we were committing to a series of books that had a very long time specific length and they hadn't been written or conceived and the author kind of felt they only had one book in them, but they needed to naturally sort of be more in the series. I feel like that's the only time that it would be a conversation. But in most cases, even with series books, we often still say, let's focus on book one so that it could work as a standalone or the beginning of a series and sort of see how it does. Mm -hmm. um, we don't focus on age. Otherwise, you know, our youngest author was 16 when we signed them. Uh, and our oldest author to date is in their 90s. So, Wow. So Lisa has asked, what percentage of your traditional model books have you found through open submissions um, by the website? So for our first eight years, every single book we published was from our direct submissions. Uh, we weren't seeking agented submissions and we weren't go and except for one book we weren't actively going out and tapping people on the shoulder and saying have you thought about writing this book uh now I would say it's probably 40 percent of our books are from direct submission um and then the rest are repeat authors so authors that we've previously signed that may have come through direct submission as well um or agented books or um, non-fiction in particular books where we've approached someone specifically about a um, particular book. Mm. Uh, Shannon has asked, have any of the books you've published sold into the North American market with success? Yes, they have. Uh, so we, we handle international rights in two different ways. So we have an internal rights manager who sells the rights and so that or licenses the rights. So that's when we would go out to our network, in this case of North American publishing houses and say, we have this great book. We think it would be right for your market. Would you like to buy those license, buy the license to those rights off us? And so they would then publish the book with their own sort of branding on it. They might do a different cover design. Um, you know, they would handle the PR and marketing and there's a real benefit to doing it that way. And that's because like us in Australia, they over there have that real knowledge um, and network for their local market. So particularly for PR and marketing, that can be incredibly important. The other way that we do it is distribution. So we have our own sales force in North America and the UK. And so for certain books uh, where, you know, we think that for whatever reason, um, it's not going to sell as a rights deal or it would work better as a distribution, we would have our sales force in the US and the UK go out to all of the local retailers there and sell it in just like our sales force does here in Australia. And so our edition of the book would be out in stores there. Um, so with our cover, our logo, you know, we are funding uh, any of the marketing or publicity for that book. Um, in terms of what's worked for us in those markets, uh, a lot of gift has worked in those markets. So gift books, um, broader kind of non-fiction titles, anything that's too overly Australian in the non-fiction space is a really hard sell anywhere else. Uh, in terms of fiction, uh, Australian focus, it doesn't have as, as big of a negative impact. Um, you know, uh, we, for example, had great success selling the rights to one of our series called the Roland Sinclair series, which was a kind of historical crime series set in Australia in the 1930s. And it, you know, really is very Australian, you know, it's, it's about the building of the Harbour Bridge. And so, you know, critical things happening in Australian history at that time. And that has sold really well in the US and the UK. Um, so I think that that Australian, yeah, focus piece is not as big of an issue for fiction. Um, that said, one of the biggest things we come across from US publishers is that they'll say, uh, you know, that's a really good story, but we already have our own version of this kind of author, mm -hmm. so we're not looking. Yeah. Nathalia has asked, have you published any collaborations between diverse authors and European writers? If yes, were they successful and what helped facilitate those relationships? Um, we've just 
we just launched last year the Liminal and Pantera Press Nonfiction Prize for um, First Nations writers and Australian writers of colour. Uh, and Lim Liminal is an organisation based in Melbourne who are very focused on, um, you know, that white bias that we mentioned before, particularly for book awards. Um, and so they are doing a lot of sort of work in that space to make sure that writers of colour in Australia um, have access to a very broad and commercial readership mm -hmm. um, and so we partnered with them and fully funded the prize and a subsequent anthology which will be published at the end of this year um, so that's a wide range of Australian born or Australian living writers all writing different um, non-fiction pieces we, we previously did a fiction anthology as well uh, so I think that that's a good starting point for where we yeah. are but there's obviously so much more work to be doing in this space yeah. Betty has said a competition seems pretty high in terms of new books coming out each month. Can you estimate how many Australian and other print books are published each month? And they've also said, I read somewhere that only 1% of Australian authors sell more than a thousand books. Could you comment on that too? Mm, great questions. Um, how many books come out a month? <laughs> I should know this. I don't. I would say hundreds. Um, in terms of what was the other part of the question? Selling more than a thousand copies? Yeah, so one percent of Australian authors sell more than a thousand copies. Um, I, I would say that it is more than like I would say more than one percent of authors are selling um, more than a thousand copies. If you look at BookScan each week, which is how many books have sold in the market, um, the top ten, depending on the time of year, you know, Christmas, it's obviously a lot bigger than say. June um, but the top 10 typically will have titles in there that have sold anywhere between kind of 10,000 to 200,000 copies in that one week alone so there certainly are specific authors that sit at that very high end of the market um, that said if you then go from position 10 to probably position 4,000 on that list you're looking at authors that have sold between like a hundred and you know 8,000 copies that week alone so I think that kind of gives a good framework um, for sort of life sales for a book mm. most of our fiction authors um, you know and we're obviously looking at that more commercial end of the market we're looking for books that will really sell kind of you know 5,000 to 100,000, but, you know, more realistically, 5,000 to maybe 13,000 in their lifetime. Amazing. Um, how important is an online author platform? That's a question from Rowena. Yeah, great question. Um, it depends how engaged and genuine you are. I think back in the day, all publishers would say to authors, you've got to be on Facebook. And then it became, you've got to be on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, all of these other things. If these are platforms that you can get to know and be genuine in and you're engaged and you understand them and you're happy to spend a dedicated amount of time each week doing them, then it's a great place to live. If these are profiles that you're creating and then not doing anything with them or you're posting 100 things and then not looking at it again for a few months, don't bother. Um, so, you know, in those spaces, it's very much about genuine engagement. And, you know, yes, it can be really beneficial, but you can also spend a huge amount of time, you know, building these things for them not to reach the right audience. So if you love being in those spaces, great, use that to your advantage. If not, find other ways to create networks and connect with people. It does not have to be social media. Mm. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left and a couple of questions specifically related to uh, genre and the, the things that you're accepting. So if you like, I'll just, we can do it rapid fire. Yes mm. or no? Yep. <laughs> um, to get through these. So are you accepting verse novels? Uh, so novels written in poetic form? Yes, we've got one going to our acquisitions meeting next week. Perfect. Uh, what about submissions for children's books, such as those for ages 8 to 12, so middle grade? We, uh, we are accepting them. We have a very small focus on them. Um, we uh, 
middle grade is difficult because the price point for the books is really low. That said, the potential readership of those books can be incredibly high. Um, so in that area, we would be more conservative. We'd be looking for books that we think tick every single one of our box. It's a great story. It, you know, has some kind of social commentary or underlying message that really speaks to young people um, and that it's well written and that the mm. author in that case, it would be important that the author would be able and willing to engage online and with, you know, schools and that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, are you interested in climate fiction or stories uh, told in the voice of animals? Yes. Awesome. Uh, finally, you mentioned crime. Um, what about true crime? Love true crime. We haven't published any true crime. We've published a few fictional stories based on true crime um all i would flag is that the legal legalities of a lot of nonfiction can be really difficult um so if you're writing true crime for example or really any nonfiction um that has the potential to upset people or defame people or anything like that be really careful um think about it uh, but also know that a publishing house willing to take something on would have their own legal team and would already have you know, factored that into their costings that it would likely need to be legaled quite heavily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be a minefield. Yes. All right. Um, that's all we have time for today. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, but thank you so much all for being here. And thank you, Ali from Pantera Press for joining us and giving us your time today. Um, the next First Friday will be held on Friday, the 1st of April with Ben Bowen, CEO of the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. And you can register for that online now. Um, also just a quick note to say that our new season of courses will be live on the website from Monday the 7th of March so make sure to check that out but other than that thank you Ali, thank you everybody it's been really really wonderful and I hope to see you all at another Writing New South Wales event soon. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for joining I've really appreciated your time and your questions hopefully we'll see submissions from you sometime soon. There you go. Take that as an invitation, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.